Karaoke bars are a place where hidden talent, or the lack of it, comes out of the woodwork. Some people truly seem to have a gift, and there are many others who've struck out musically, but they're still trying. You'll see some people who don't really know that they're tone deaf, and they are completely ignorant about it. But once they start, like everybody else around them knows that's what tone deafness sounds like. Dr. Psyche Louie is assistant professor of psychology and neuroscience at Wesleyan University. Karaoke bars are a special interest of hers. She's one of the nation's top researchers into the biology of being tone deaf. And, you know, of course, the more uninhibited you become, the more your singing starts to sound like shouting or just monotone speech. And then you start to question whether it's uninhibitedness or the tone deafness that might be giving rise to the singing. Millions of Americans have gone through life thinking they're hopelessly tone deaf when they're really not. In fact, it's kind of ironic that people who are truly tone deaf may be the last to know that they're bad singers because they can't tell the difference. Every singer and every note sounds the same to them. But most people don't fall into that category. They can tell the difference between musical pitches, but they can't reproduce them accurately. They're just bad singers. There are a lot of people who walk around thinking that they're tone deaf. About one out of seven people in the normal population think that they're really tone deaf. But a lot of times they say that because they are unable to sing. And there's lots of reasons why we can't sing, right? I mean, sometimes people are socially inhibited, but despite a fair amount of musical training, you're still unable to hear differences in pitch. Then we really define that as being tone deafness. So a lot of times people who are tone deaf actually can't hear that they're out of Tune. The difference between people who are simply bad singers and those who are really tone deaf is important. People who are tone deaf typically have what's called congenital amusia. This is defined more specifically than what people usually colloquially call tone deafness by the fact that it is a neurodevelopmental and neurogenetic disorder. So this is reflected in the fact that there are inheritable components to it. And it's also developmental and congenital. So it's a present at birth and has a developmental trajectory throughout the lifespan. That's Dr. Dominique Vouvan of the International Laboratory for Brain, Music, and Sound Research in Montreal, known as BRAMS, where some of the world's most comprehensive research into amusia goes on. She says music is a completely different and perhaps not very enjoyable experience for people who are tone deaf. I mean, if you can't tell the difference between something that's totally in tune and awesome and something that sounds like garbage to everyone else, then it's not so much fun. You know, some amusics are able to make it work, and some of them describe music as, you know, it sounds like a truck backing up, basically, like it's no different from noise for them. Some people think it all sounds the same. Some people think it sounds like clanging. Some people think it's just like very unpleasant. So it really depends whom you talk to. But how do you know if you're really tone deaf or not? Vuvan says you find out not by singing, but by listening. You let them listen to a melody, and sometimes the melody will have a note that's out of key or out of tune, and sometimes the melody will be just fine. Find out now for yourself. and they have to say, yes, this melody has some sort of weird sour note in it, or no, this melody is fine. This task is super easy for non-tone deaf individuals, including the ones who will tell you that they're tone deaf when they're really not. This is something that really is quite automatic for normal listeners. So, you know, if you listen to a tune and somebody plays a really wrong note, you'll get an almost visceral, cringing response from normal individuals. Tone deaf participants, on the other hand, cannot detect these. They just find them to sound completely normal. People who would flunk the test and are truly tone deaf make up between 2.5 and 4% of the population. They're more likely to have family that are tone deaf, too, so it's likely that genetics play a role. Louie and her team have determined that people who are truly tone deaf have specific connection problems in the brain. It's really a wiring problem, really a difference in connectivity of the major pathways of the brain between regions that are important for sound processing and regions that are important for sound production. The Brahms Laboratory has traced the path of tone perception as well and determined that part of the brain of tone deaf people cringes at wrong notes just like everybody else's. But the wiring problem cuts the message off before a tone deaf person person can hear it. Scientists have also determined that amusia is a problem that goes beyond just music. Differences in pitch are part of spoken language, especially in tonal languages such as Chinese. And even in English, inflection is one of the main ways we communicate emotion. 
So Louis says tone deafness affects more than musical abilities. Most tone deaf people, the findings also show that there are some difficulties with speech processing. So specifically, the low frequency information or the prosody information in speech. So prosody is kind of pitch information and stress information and you know sort of how you say certain sounds to convey, for instance, emotion. Given the same sentence, you could say it in a very happy way or you could say it in a very sad way or you could say it in a tender way way. There are many different ways that you can pronounce the same sentence, and that would give rise to sort of emotional content in speech. So that's known as prosody. And we know now that people who are tone deaf are not so good at processing prosody. But if tone deafness is a neurological condition from birth, what can we do about it? Well, it turns out this is one major area of difference between people who are truly tone deaf and those who are merely bad singers. Vocal training helps bad singers match pitch and get better. Tone deaf people may be beyond help. Tone deaf individuals do improve a little bit over time, but not the way that a normal individual does. You might have an individual who comes into the lab and says, you know, I can't carry a tune in a bucket, basically. I think I'm tone deaf, but you'll test them a few times and they'll get so much better with testing that you realize it's just, oh, you probably just didn't spend enough time singing or playing an instrument or being around music. It's an experiential issue, not so much a neurological developmental issue like real true tone deafness is. In other words, with enough training, it's likely you can make a bad singer into a competent one. There are people who are poor pitch singers. They're not really tone deaf, but they just can't really get their voices to map the intended sound. So it's really an auditory motor mapping problem. And that's actually quite common. And I think that maybe training can help people who are poor pitch singers a lot more than people who actually can can't hear the target of what they're supposed to produce, which is closer to what tone deafness is about. There are lots of things that voice training can do to your brain, such as changing the wiring patterns and white matter pathways of your brain. We've looked at people with voice training compared to other types of musicians compared to non-musicians. And in general, the finding is that brain pathways that are connecting your auditory and motor regions are actually better connected in people who are musically trained and especially in people who have voice training. However, that's not how we think of singing and not how most bad singers think of themselves. For some reason, singing is viewed more as something you either have or don't have. And particularly once somebody is an accurate singer, we don't think that's going to change over time. In other words, once you can do it, it's like riding a bike. You can always do it. But Dr. Stephen Demarest, professor of music education at Northwestern University, says that's not how it really is. Singing ability does wax and wane depending on how engaged you are in it. In that way, it's like other skills, particularly other musical skills, which on the one hand says if you want to be good, you better practice. But on the other hand says if you're not good, practicing will make you better. I really think for some reason, singing is not seen that way. For some reason, singing is seen as this gift that you're either given or not. And while a beautiful singing voice is a wonderful gift, I'll be the first to say that, it's nice to hear somebody who has a beautiful voice. If we look closely, I think we'll see that that beautiful voice came through a combination, perhaps, of a predisposition, but also some really hard work and a lot of engagement in singing. Demarest did a study showing that singing well is like a lot of other abilities. You either use it or lose it. He tested kindergartners, sixth graders, and adults in their ability to match pitch accurately or sing in tune. He found a great deal of improvement between kindergarten and sixth grade, but when he tested adults... We assumed that either the adults would be at the level of the sixth graders, assuming no significant differences in background between our adults and our sixth graders, we thought they'd be at the level of sixth graders or possibly they would have improved with more maturity. Instead, what we found that on two of the three tasks, the adults sort of regressed. They were more like kindergartners and sixth graders on two of the three tasks. We don't know why. One of the possible explanations for our results and the one that we think is most likely is that once mandatory music ends, we know that most people don't go on to elective music. So if you stop singing after sixth grade in any consistent way, it's likely that the skill goes down. You get worse. But it doesn't take being in something like a choir to maintain your singing chops. Singing along with the radio can do it, singing in the shower. But a lot of people have given up on even that because somebody once told them they can't sing. People who are sort of labeled as inaccurate 
it's kind of damaging to them in terms of their future participation choices in music. They really think of themselves as somehow unmusical, like this is something that can't be fixed. We have research with adults where they literally recount when somebody told them, whether it was a music teacher all too often or a family member and what age they were and where they were. And they really remember this. It seems to be kind of a scarring experience because saying you can't play the piano well, somehow that doesn't hit you as personally. But when you say you can't sing, it's like a part of you is flawed, not just your skill level. In our culture, Demarest says, we're not encouraged to sing. We don't have very many risk-free places to get better. But he says, hand kids a microphone and they're doing American Idol. Sometimes badly, but at least they're doing it. Karaoke is a place. So it's not a choir thing, it's just a singing thing. But depending on who you hang with and what kind of a karaoke bar you might go to, it's okay to be bad at it to a certain extent. So it can be a place where people can try stuff out and maybe get better. And now with a lot of stuff available online. But I do think we are lacking opportunities. If you go to certain countries, group singing is a part of public gatherings, festivals, there's more folk music kind of in the air. We don't really have that even anymore when you go to a sporting event. The national anthem is sung to you rather than with you. And even if you're not a Tony Bennett or Lady Gaga, singing is good for you. It releases feel-good chemicals in the brain, so it's a natural stress reliever. Even if you can't carry a tune yet, so go ahead. Just sing, sing a song. You can find out more about all of our guests on our website, RadioHealthJournal.net. You can always find our shows on iTunes and Stitcher. I'm Reed Pence. More than 86 million Americans are living with prediabetes, but nearly 90% of them don't know they have it. That's why the American Medical Association and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are partnering to increase awareness about prediabetes through a new initiative called Prevent Diabetes Stat. AMA President Dr. Robert Waugh. Type 2 diabetes is one of our nation's leading causes of suffering and death. It's time that we, as a nation, come together and take immediate action to prevent it by screening for prediabetes and helping those who have prediabetes prevent the progression to type 2 diabetes through proven lifestyle changes. Prevent Diabetes STAT stands for Screen, Test, Act Today. It provides tools that guide physician practices to identify and refer people with prediabetes to evidence-based diabetes prevention programs in their communities. Act Today. Find out more at PreventDiabetesStat.org or call your physician's office to see if prediabetes screening makes sense for you. Act today and join the effort to prevent diabetes. When the leading antihistamine and Nasacort go nose to nose, Nasacort wins. Stopping more of the chemical responses that can cause your nasal allergy symptoms. And when you stop more causes, you get 24 hour relief from sneezing, an itchy runny nose, even congestion. It's prescription strength medicine available over the counter. Nasacort Allergy 24 hour. Stops more of what makes you miserable. Uses directed. 